Today I'm going to talk about the uh, early days of FPGAs. I think uh, many people don't realize quite how old they are. Um, so Xilinx was founded in 1984 and the first FPGA came out in 1985, the XC2064. And here's, here's one of them from, I think the date code is 1991. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see, you know, what was going on in the world at that time. So 1984, the first 286 PC, the PCAT came out. 386 invented in 1985. You know, this is, a, this is the PC DOS era, not even MS DOS quite yet. <laughs> uh, 486 in 1989. In the 90s, we started to get Windows, maybe Windows 3.1, Windows for work groups, maybe the first good version of Windows or, you know, first, well, Windows 95 is really the first version that is uh, relevant maybe for uh, design tools. Um, so there are other programmable logic chips. There's PALs uh, from Monolithic Memories from 1978. Uh, Altera invented this EPLD in uh, when, 1984, that was available. Uh, and the, the languages for these chips, so there was Palasm, Couple, very, very early, 1983, Abel, 1984. Uh, VHDL is actually, I didn't even realize this till I looked, VHDL is, is somewhat older than Verilog in that, uh, at least it was designed earlier. I don't know how, how popular it became. Verilog in 1984, in the, in the early days of... Uh, FPGA design, I didn't really see Verilog. Maybe somebody had access to it. I, I certainly did not. I think because Cadence owned it and it was kind of closed. Um, so really, the, the first design entry method for FPGAs was schematics. And that's why I have this ORCAD founding on here. Um, and you'll see, I'm going to show you what, what that looked like. So. You got your Xilinx data book from 1989. I'm not sure why I have the 1989 one. <laughs> uh, and you decide, hey, here's some chip prices. These are probably 1993 prices. I was looking at this, I think. Uh, so you decide you want to use your FPGA. You got your 3000 series. There we go, the 2000 series. 64 configurable logic blocks. Check it out, CLB at the time, one flip flop. <laughs> you got four inputs, but really it's three inputs with two different outputs. Very primitive. You got your switch matrix, your routing matrix, and here we go. Here's the entire chip on one page. Can't do that today. <laughs> uh, what's interesting, these early FPGAs had a built-in crystal oscillator. Here's how, how we configure them. And all this early XC2000 FPGA. Oh yeah, here's the pinout. <laughs> all the dedicated configuration pins. Anyway, so you decide you want to program these chips. What do you do? Well, here's the schematic entry on your PC workstation. I don't know what program. That looks like a PCAT, and I don't know what program that is. That might be FutureDet? I don't know. Or Schema? I don't know what that one is. Um, so you needed this design entry, and here, here are the options. Right, this is this is kind of the workflow, but if you look up here, you got FutureNet Dash, Schema Two, and ORCAD. I've heard of people using FutureNet. Schema Two, I don't think I ever saw anybody using that one. Uh, ORCAD was it was big because I I saw lots of people using this for board board design. So this is the route that I went. I got the uh, ORCAD 
SDT, Schematic Design Tools, with the Xilinx DS35 option, so that, uh, you know, this included the uh, primitive library for ORCAD, and it lets you convert ORCAD into Xilinx land. <laughs> uh, it's also interesting in this book, is if you look at the uh, article reprints, You got your app typical FPGA early applications. You know, very bunch of simple stuff. But then we got PS2 microchannel interface, <laughs> DRAM controller, high speed barcode reader. Yeah. So in 1993, I bought the development system. And I remember it was quite expensive, although I don't remember the price. $1,500? I don't really remember. So this is what you got. First of all, a box of floppies. FPGA Core Tools. Oh, uh, yeah. ORCAD Base Install Disk. SDT VST interface. VST SDT was the schematic capture program, and VST was an ORCAD simulator. So you could simulate. Well, Xilinx didn't come with a simulator, you, but you could use ORCADs. It's kind of interesting. I never did that. <laughs> ORCAD tutorial. <laughs> EPL EPLD core tools. Yeah, Xilinx had their own EPLDs also, and I never used in this in these early years. I never used them. I just used the FPGAs. So anyway, you got your floppies. What else do you got? You got this stupid security dongle. This is a real shame that they uh, protected their software with this security dongle. This, I mean, even today, this is a huge headache. Uh, so I can't run this in DOSBox because I don't have any way for DOSBox to access a real parallel port. Um, it's really these this, these things annoy the heck out of me. <laughs> so what else did you get? You got this big stack of books. Read me first. Gotta have a read me first document. System user guide, base development system. You got your reference guide. Come back to that one in a minute. The library's guide. One of the kind of cooler things that you got is this Best of Excel. Uh, Peter Alfke, editor. So I remember this guy. Uh, I was a big user of uh, Usenet. And he would be on comp.arc.fpga, the Usenet news group. I, I, I'm sure I traded messages with him. <laughs> uh, but this, this was kind of great. And in particular, you know, it t tells you what you can do with these FPGAs, how they really work. You really needed to, needed to look at this. This got you out of the TTL, you know, discrete logic and into the on-chip logic. Uh, and one one particular one that is very useful in these in these small FPGAs is the linear feedback shift rater. So if you remember early FPGAs, the logic block. If you stare at this, you realize there is no carry logic. There's no dedicated carry logic. So actually, binary counters in the early FPGAs and adders they were not that efficient. <laughs> so what you could do instead is you use these linear feedback shift registers. So a linear feedback shift register, it's, it's like a noise generator. Uh, this is the circuit and depending on how many bits you want, this told you, you know, which taps you would use for your uh, exclusive NOR gate. They use exclusive NOR because uh, on the FPGA all the bits are initialized to zero. So exclusive OR you get all 2n combinations except for 0. With exclusive NOR, you get all 2n combinations except for uh, all 1s. But this was a very uh, logic-efficient way of making a counter. 
basically use a random number generator and you run a little program to figure out, okay, I want to divide by 259. So you would use like a 9-bit guy and you have to go figure out what code is the 259th code. Very useful. Peter Alfke in Excel. <laughs> yeah, this is all good, very interesting. I read this these eagerly when I was younger. What else did you get? You got, and this is what started, this, this is what inspired me to make this video, because I found this in my junk pile. You got your Xilinx FPGA demonstration board. I'll zoom this, on this guy a little bit, whoops. From 1991. <laughs> And what you did, this is the programming interface. This is the uh, parallel cable three that I got here. This is the power, these, this, these jumpers right here. I've got a seven segment display and these, these cool big LEDs. Actually, uh, I'm drawing right on them. A dip switch for the input. And uh, I soldered in a, uh, an os a uh, crystal, four megahertz crystal, and you need this resistor to make the uh, CMOS inverter to get it to run in uh, analog mode. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is show you what it is like to program an FPGA in MS-DOS using these tools, and we'll download the design onto this board. and uh, get it to work. Oh yeah, again, so uh, I bought the ORCAD interface. So ORCAD, let me show you this, it's also kind of interesting. I think in 1993, the same year I bought ORCAD. ORCAD pointer, look at this thing. A quarterly newsletter in 1992. See, I must, I'm pretty sure I bought this in 1993. Look at the issues. So these letters are all talking about ORCAD. This is this is ORCAD for DOS, and uh, ORCAD for DOS had a big following, and they're all talking about. I'm sure ORCAD at this time, you know, was working on Windows. But there's kind of a debate in the community because if because the Windows version is going to be very different from the DOS version. <laughs> Designing with designing here's ORCAD's take on FPGAs. You can use uh, ORCAD to design your XC2000, 3000, and 4000 FPGAs. Oh, look at this smoke from the OS war. Can OS2 version 2 wander out of business and research communities to win the hearts and minds of users? Mm, no. <laughs> Yeah, ORCAD. So ORCAD, you got all these. You got your floppies and these manuals. What's kind of funny is that Xilinx's description of how to use ORCAD is actually better than ORCAD's description of how to use ORCAD. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, again, that's this book. And yeah, there's your quick reference card for, uh, for using ORCAD. All good, all good stuff. So in ORCAD, the whole idea was you would design your circuits using these uh, just conventional gates and the tools would convert them into FPGAs. You know, they would uh, optimize the design, map it into FPGA CLVs. All right, now, to run these tools, let me show you what I have to do. All because of the stupid security talk. I would do this in, I would do this in DOSBox, except for the stupid security talk. <laughs> so today, my PC kind of fell apart, 
Actually, it was in the, in the basement. It got corroded. And I had to fix the short that was on it. So today, we are using... Today, we are using the Super Micro P5 STE. Oh, some Cirrus Logic graphics card. Pentium P P55D, I think. 64 megs of RAM. Here's another. This is the security dongle right here. This is this is a slightly newer one than the one uh, I showed earlier. Power supply. Power supply shorted out, so that's why this is all out. The Seagate Metalist Pro hard drive. No, just Seagate Metalist. What am I saying? Eight gig. Floppy for some reason. Floppy. Anyway, look back here. So to make this video without, uh, oh, come on. To make this video without just aiming the camera at the screen, I got one of these. Where is it? I got one of these. VGA capture devices. So it works, but it's not perfect. And one of the stupid issues is that this thing, the minimum resolution it captures is 640 by 480, um, which is fine, except for MS DOS text mode resolution is lower than that. It's like what is it, 640 by 200 or something. So this can't capture the text mode. But I found that you can put the, uh, there's a VESA mode, uh, like mode 12 or something, that does run uh, text. I guess it's simulated text mode in the 640 by 480 VGA graphics. Uh, and that works, except where the cursor doesn't show up. But Still, it'll be better video quality than what you see if I just capture the screen. <laughs> so I need the keyboard. And I will come back with the uh, laptop. All right, here we are in, hopefully, if the thing is recording, yes, in MS-DOS land. So if you want to create a design, First thing we do is we start ORCAD. This is like the design manager. What do they call it? Their ESP tool. No. What do they call it? I don't remember. Yeah, their ESP design environment. This is because they didn't have Windows yet. <laughs> uh, so we go into design management tools. And we're going to create a design. And bar, as in foo bar. Oops. And all this does is it copies files from a template directory to your new directory. Now, if you start editing your schematic from here, here's the this, here's this, here's this schematic editor. The problem is you're in, uh, you know, this is board design land. It's not, not what you need for FPGAs. So we exit this. We exit the whole thing. Go into the directory. And you type, um, what is it? Xdraft3. So what this does is it sets up the schematic tools for editing the Xilinx 3000 series FPGAs. No VST, that's okay. A few warnings, but that's okay. So if you look, uh, the schematic design tools use this sdt.cfg file, so we can just take a look at that. So now it points to this lib equals stuff, is it's pointing to the, the libraries, the Xilinx libraries. 
Oh, I can't even, can't even exit. So now, now I'm not even going to use that uh, WorkCAD environment anymore. I just use the direct, I just use the, the schematic design tool draft directly. All right, so now we got our XC3000 libraries available. And here's all the parts. Like if you want an AND gate, you know, you, you kind of have to just memorize these parts, but they're all systematized. So like here's a two input AND gate. And what you what you would do is like an AND 2B1. What that means is one of the invert one of the inputs is inverted. So an AND gate with one inverted input. But what I'm going to make is just, we're just going to blink a lead. <laughs> so first thing we need is the, uh, what is it? The oscillator. Yes. This is the crystal oscillator. And we're going to make a, uh, let's say, divide by 16 counter. And I'm going to do that in as a uh, hierarchy. So we name it divide by 16, 1, I guess. And it needs a file name. Divide by 16.sch schematic. Uh, needs an input port. Let's say CK input. Oops, except I didn't want to put it there. And we need some output ports. Let's say, oh, Q1. Oops, what did I do? Make it a little smaller with it on here. All right. So you you definitely use the hierarchy for everything. We'll connect the wire here. Now what I want is uh, so so this oscillator is like four megahertz. So we're going to divide it by a million. So I need five of these. So we will just cut this. Oh, nope. Uh, how do you do that? Box save. And block get. Now, you see this, what I just did? Oh. ORCAD, the principle that it worked on is this auto pan. And I love this. I don't know why this never took off in the uh, uh, user interface world. Because auto pan with the mouse is extremely fast and convenient. All right, so we got five four bit dividers. So that's 20 bits. Now we're going to hook up the output to a LED. <laughs> What you need is a output buffer and an output pad. And we need the pin number. Ah, oh, where's that book? Lead zero is pin 29. I'm not going to need all those. Pin 29. Okay, now we didn't make the divider though. Oh, and also all these have to have different names or different instances. They can have the, uh, the same underlying sheet. 
but they definitely need different names. Okay, so now we'll make the sheet. Module port name, CK is the input. Put that here. We get a flip flop. So we're going to clock our flip flop with this input. We're going to make a divide by two. This is a very simple. a bunch of them. Actually, remembering how to do this, if you just start at the first number you want, it auto numbers, so that would have been a lot easier to do. basically making a module, you know, asynchronous ripple counter with each one of these is a different clock domain. And uh, that is pretty much it. All right, so we got our schematic. We're sending it out to a, a pad. That's it. Come on. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I did forget one thing. Hold on a second. Uh, what you can do is put the, uh, the part you're using. So a 3020PC68-100 is just a text comment. And then the tool knows what the part is. So it's a 3020 FPGA on that little uh, evaluation board. Okay, now in theory, oh, there's one more thing we have to do. Um, the, it, well, I'll show it this way first. The way you build your chip is you just have XMake and the design. So it's annotating the schematic converting it to a, a netlist, XNF merge, merges multiple net, netlists together, XNF prep does some logic optimizations, XNF map converts it to a uh, Xilinx CLBs, then map to L LCA, converts this, that into uh, the LCA, APR is the place and route tool, and make bits converts it to the bitstream, and it failed. And it failed because this make bits has this dash S0 option. At dash S0 is enabling, or it disables the crystal oscillator. So we're gonna go into the, the Xilinx Design Manager and fix that. So all this is, uh, what this xmake program does, it just makes a make file. So bar.make, this is the make file you get. And each step on this is just the usual dependency-based, uh, you know, the make figures it out based on the uh, modification time of the file, just like in software. Um, and you can use like Microsoft Make or, or uh, Turbo C Make, any make will work with this file. Um, so you could just edit the fix into this file, but I want to show the design, the Xilinx Design Manager. So remember we had that uh, ORCAD ESP well, Xilinx had their own thing, this design manager tool. Yeah. See, now we have another mouse-driven tool. 
so it's got like the wrong the wrong chip so we what you got to do is you set up okay what what family we're going to do the XC3000 and the part is in the design so I don't have to set the part <laughs> um, options yeah there we go that's what I'm looking for so each of these tools so we need make bits where is it make bits and we need to set the enable the oscillator oh, divide by two sure uh, done and I think what that does is it hopefully modifies the make file and I think we can build it right from here well I'm not going to do that because it's going to use the wrong it'll use the wrong mode yeah there we go now we can quit and if we're lucky it modified the make file although I have to edit it by hand <laughs> did it do it no it did not awesome okay so we'll use the editor to do it <laughs> This is the only editor that I found that works, and it, and it only works a little. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. Yep, there we go. I'm blind because there's no cursor. Stupid MS DOS. Okay, Control K, X. There we go. Okay, so we'll try this again. X make. Now, if you type bar.make, it just it doesn't create a new make file. It uses the one that already exists. So now we build it. Hey, hey, we made the bit file. Now, we need to download it to the board. And I have to plug in the power for that. X checker bar download the pro they call it X I think their first cable must have been called the X checker cable all right we got the blinking lead so it worked um, so another thing we can do is look at what this thing did we can look at the actual design There's the mouse and you do that with the uh, XDE the Xilinx de design environment. So you pick your design. Where is it? Design right here. Bar.lc, the famous.lca files. And edit the LCA. LCA means logic cell array. So here it is. This is the chip. And you can look at what the, uh, the place and route tools actually did. Move, move around. Not as nice as Orcad uh, auto panning. Uh, so right here is the oscillator input, and this goes to the first divider. So we can, what we can do is look at what this this is. This is a CLB. Uh, if we go to block, what is it? Edit block. We'll look at this thing. So this is how the CLB is configured. This is a little hard to uh, read here, but if you look over here, K is the input to the flip-flop, makes QX flip-flop, and X is the output. And the X also goes to this F function generator. And what does the F function of the generator do? The equation is down here, F equals not QX. So that's the inverter. Uh, no. And what I always forget is how to close this. Block, oh yeah, block done or something. End block, there we go. So there's one. And you can just follow the, my mouse is being a little nutty. You can follow the output to this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. Then these. Then all of these. 
then these, and eventually, anyway, eventually, eventually it goes out to the, the pad right over here, pin 29. <laughs> Now let's make it just a little bit more interesting. I'll add a little bit more logic to the chip. We do something with these uh, other LEDs. So let's let's get a shift register. So here's a shift register. What we're going to make is a. Uh, Johnson counter. It's a simple counter. All, all that means is that the input of the shift register is the in, inverted of one of the outputs. And how many? And we got seven LEDs left, so I'll make this a seven bit one. So the clock, we will take that from. Actually, what I'm going to do is buff G. Buff G is a global, global clock buffer. So this is a sync. All of these were asynchronous. This is a synchronous design. So we really want that to use a global clock buffer. So we'll make, we'll pick one of these higher speeds. Uh, and we just route these all to. Oh, now I remember this. <laughs> This is the usual schematic thing. It doesn't fit very conveniently. So we need seven of these. Just move this over a little. We'll get seven of them. fit. Whatever. I don't care. <laughs> okay. We'll just connect them all up. All those fits. There we go. to assign the pin numbers. Location constraint. And what are they? 30, 31, 32, I See, I put them too close together. All the words are overlapping. 30, 31. 32, Now you can do much better actually in ORCAD than what I'm doing here. I haven't done this in a while. But ORCAD has keyboard macros, so the, the, really the way I would do this is have a keyboard macro, and in the keyboard, in the right in the middle of the macro, you can have an interrupt for the number you want to enter. Um, and my muscle memory, I, it's still starting to come back a bit, but uh, I did a lot of work in this program. All right, so we have our Johnson counter. So you know this has a, this has like an extra bit, but we don't care because that'll get optimized out. Oh, clock enable, we have to do something with, with that. Connect to VCC. Yeah. Clear. Connect at the ground.
There we go. Um, and I should show you that in these libraries, what they did is because all the logic designers in these early days, they all knew these uh, TTL, you know, you, you, you just memorized all these TTL devices. So here's like a 74138 3 to 8 decoder. So if you knew you were TTL chips, you could design it, design your logic that way. Anyway, let's build this and see what happens. X make. Oh, come on. Here it goes. In the big designs, and when you have timing constraints, the part of this that takes forever is the place and route. <laughs> You know, it would take hours and hours. Actually, that was the biggest. I remember in the uh, in the very early days, if you had you know 16 megahertz, 386 or something, oh, this took forever. Ah, it did it. So let's do the X checker. We're gonna check it. The X checker. Reset. Go. There we go. So we got our our blinking lead and our uh, oh I gotta change the exposure on this thing. Well I'm not gonna, I'm gonna turn the light off. How about that? I'm gonna see better. <laughs> Too dark. But there you have it. Now let me show you one other thing that's kind of interesting. Um Xilinx have this higher level, with, beginning with the 4000 series, they had this uh, kind of high level language that they made, a visual, visual synthesis language. You know, they didn't have, uh, you didn't have Verilog yet. And I remember that, uh, you know, so, so have, this, is, this design suite is called Exact, and the next one is called Foundation. In Foundation, there was a design, there was a Verilog synthesis tool with it, and I think it was Design Compiler, a version of the, uh, you know, Design Compiler is the big logic synthesis tool for uh, ASICs. Bar one. <laughs> um, but it was kind of terrible. And I remember there's Mentor, Leonardo, Leonardo was another synthesis, Verilog synthesis tool. But the first one that was good was Simplicity. And I used that like in 2000 and finally switched over, you know, done with this silly schematic way of entering designs. Uh, the problem with the schematics is, you know, if you do complicated state machines, you sure you can go do it, but they're kind of write only designs. It's too complicated to understand someone else's design. Um, what am I doing here? X draft 4000 E series. Good enough. I'm not even gonna, I don't have, I, what I need to get is the, uh, the uh, XC 4000 demo board. I might do that. <laughs> Have fun of it. But, uh, okay, bar one. So let me show you this. It's kind of, kind of interesting. So Xilinx had this thing called X-Blocks. And what you did is, this is kind of a higher level, you use this, the schematic tool in a much more abstract way. So where is it in inputs? Okay, so we, we would have inputs. And what this is, this, this thick line here, what that's implying is that that's a bus. It's multiple pins. Um, more inputs. And we'll get a... Uh, I, I didn't use this tool that much, but I was definitely aware of it. Oops, no. The add subtractor. Let's do that one. See, what you would do is just connect so even though 
I'm not using an ORCAD bus, I'm just using an ORCAD wire. These are buses. It's really just using this as an abstract thing. Uh, outputs. I'm going to move the whole thing. Look space. So we're going to say that this bus right here, what are its properties? Well, we're going to say that it is, uh, its encoding is, let's say, unsigned binary. And its size is three to zero. So this is a four bit. So these properties are basically getting attached to this wire, which isn't really a wire, it's a bus. And then it would infer, well, this is an adder. It would infer that since the output is four bits, well, the inputs are also four bits. Um, and you can, you can design, it's kind of like a little bit, bit of uh, VHDL without text. Um, you know, and I think this idea never really went away in Xilinx because their, their block design, you know, in, in modern Vivado, you had your block design. It's kind of doing the same thing. Uh, but this is an early way of uh, doing it for the 4000 series. It's, I, I, I remember I was annoyed that this did not work. Actually, I could not understand why this did not work in the uh, 3000 and 2000 series either. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know why, you know, the, the 4000 series had RAMs, so there's more options. Um, oh yeah, and what you did, so, so if you, if you could mix this X block stuff with uh, the more primitive. So if, if, I, if I do this bus interface 4, this would break out, so this left side is the bus, and here are the bits that make up the bus. And now I can, you know, hook up an inverter or whatever. So that was an interesting early uh, high-level synthesis tool, <laughs> schematic-based. Anyway, that's it.